into account. We don't support it, Mr Speaker, and I will not be voting in favour of this legislation. Good Mr Speaker, I call Michael Wood. Mr Speaker, very pleased to uh, stand in support of the bill at this its third reading. But I have to say, after that uh, last address, I'm a little bit confused because you see, Mr Speaker, throughout the course of the debate that's proceeded through the House, the main objection that the uh, National Party has fired away at this bill is that it would be too hard to have a dual mandate. It would be too hard for the Reserve Bank and the highly qualified men and women who make up it to consider two things at any one time. Yet what we had from Amy Adams in her comments today was a suggestion, actually, uh, that actually there isn't enough in there. That actually, we need, if we go to the purpose of the bill, her main criticism of it is that we don't have an expensive enough approach to the factors that we're going to be asking the Reserve Bank to consider. So one of the things that I think has been very difficult for the government to grapple with in terms of its engagement with the opposition on this bill is what is it that they actually want? And so my question for Amy Adams is if she supports the purpose of the bill, but she is critical that the subsequent provisions do not include uh, enough factors from the purpose statement of the bill, where was the SOP statement on the table during the committee stage? What actually are the factors in the purpose that are missing that she would like to see in there? Because we haven't heard a single constructive critique that actually gives us some direction on that from the National Party. In fact, Mr Speaker, what we have had from this bill from the National Party is absolute chicken little catastrophism. And that, was, that came through very strongly in the absurd statements that we heard today and throughout the course of this debate about Reserve Bank independence. The fact of the matter, Mr Speaker, and this is reflected very clearly in virtually all of the submissions that the committee heard, is that this is a moderate and balanced piece of legislation that seeks to strike a good balance in terms of ensuring that we have the ongoing objective of price stability while ensuring that the real uh, economy concerns, particularly around sustaining employment, are considered by the Reserve Bank. And members who are familiar with the operations of the Reserve Bank will actually know that the key changes which are formalised and put in legislation in a transparent fashion through the course of this bill are, way, uh, uh, um, are things that the Reserve Bank is actually moving on already. So what this bill does is confirm that we will have a monetary policy committee. This is a good idea, because what we know is that in all institutional settings, it is better to have a number of people feeding in with different perspectives before you make major decisions than leaving all the power in one person's hand. And in an informal way, the Reserve Bank confirms to us at Finance and Expenditure Committee that this is in fact the way that they have been informally operating for a number of years. So doesn't it make sense, Mr Speaker, to actually have legislation that A, reflects that, and B, actually sets it up in a transparent fashion? In the same sense, Mr Speaker, we have had policy, tar uh, policy targets agreements under this uh, government, and also the government of 99 to 2008, which asked the Reserve Bank to consider the factor of maximum sustainable employment. And that's because on this side of the House, Mr Speaker, we actually do believe that that is one of the most important things in our economic architecture. Yeah, yeah. It is not the contention of members on this side of the House that the Reserve Bank has sole preserve over determining the, the rate of employment within the economy. Clearly, that is a function of a number of economic factors. But what we do know, what we do know is that the Reserve Bank uh, at the extreme ends of the economic cycle does have the power to influence that. Why else was it that after the, uh, the uh, global financial crisis that the Reserve Bank dramatically cut interest rates? Because they wanted to stimulate aggregate demand in the economy to try and keep growth going, to try and keep uh, employment going. So, Mr Speaker, the changes that are made in the course of this bill are moderate and they are balanced. Uh, this bill preserves Reserve Bank operational independence, and there is not a single serious non-partisan independent commentator that the opposition can cite who says anything other than that. And one of the messages I have for the opposition in the course of this bill is that they can't just sort of stand up and say, it has to be bipartisan or you shouldn't be doing it, when they, when they don't uh, actually engage in the debate in a constructive and informed way and simply act as a bloc. As I say, Mr Speaker, not a single independent, non-partisan commentator who actually seriously contends that Reserve Bank operational independence is changed through the course of this legislation. Uh, the Monetary P Policy Committee still has a complete remit, a complete remit um, to, uh, to set um, the official cash rate and make the other uh, important decisions that it has to make. Uh, people like Adrian Orr, the Governor of the Reserve Bank, 
are not shrinking violets. And the suggestion that we just heard in the speech from A.B. Adams that somehow they are going to be cowed and not carry out their duties independently is simply absurd. Mr Speaker, once again, this is a moderate and a balanced piece of legislation. It is in the mainstream of legislation uh, for central banks around the world. It makes the operations of the Reserve Bank more transparent to the people of New Zealand and to this parliament. And for all of those reasons, I commend it to the House. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I call the Honourable Paul Goldsmith. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I rise to a